All right, here we grow. Welcome back to this episode. I am joined by a very special guest, my soul sister, Shiloh. I met Shiloh about a year ago now in Austin, and we had immediate connection, and we've stayed in touch, and I've been just in awe and honored to be a part of her journey, even though it's through the social medias and a few connections here and there, it just even popping onto this Zoom today and seeing her face and seeing your face, <laughs> I should say, feels really, really special, and I'm excited to go on this journey with you with you and dive into all that you're growing through, all you've been through, all that you're expanding into in this life. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I feel really blessed to be in the space with you and you know really feel the same way. The the connection was, you know, right off right off the start and really just seeing the different pieces of where we've really been weaving our stories, you know, kind of separately, but seeing so many similarities in the way that we've kind of flowed our our lives together and coming to that one point where we had the connection. And it's just been really beautiful to watch you, you grow and how this podcast is expanding. And I'm just grateful to be here. Yay. I love that so much. I always start my podcasts with just reminding people to take a few deep breaths and ground ourselves. And we won't lean too far into that because we have each other and we have so much to get through today. But I just wanted to remind everybody and us to take a moment to take a few deep breaths in through the nose and letting it go, just fully releasing something out the mouth and tuning into the body for a moment and finding gratitude for this incredible life vessel that we have been offered. We are spiritual beings having a human experience and just feeling this heartbeat and feeling this breath and this life force running through us is so magical. And so just taking a few minutes to connect to your body, notice what you're grateful for, notice what's moving through you. I'm just expanding and contracting and growing here in this very moment. <sighs> yeah, and just notice what comes up and feel free to bring that with us through this conversation. And hopefully that will help you grow and expand as you listen to us and listen to Shiloh's beautiful story. And, you know, as I was reflecting on this conversation and getting so excited, I thought back to all the things that we have in common. And as we have gotten to know each other, you know, between our love for snowboarding, our love for travel, our love for motorcycles, and this deep love for spirituality and the other dimensions that are available. And I find that to be a really unique mix. And so I think that that really gives us this cool foundation together that um, brings us closer. <laughs> I love. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, the mix of spirituality and the wild woman. And, you know, it's, it's so fascinating to me as I really kind of dove into my own spiritual journey. I've found this push and pull of getting to a point where I'm really soft, right? I'm finding a lot of stillness. I'm finding a lot of space within me to really expand within myself and feeling like, can I be both, right? Can I be this wild woman who rides a motorcycle and loves snowboarding and adventure and still be this spiritual being who can find stillness and can find that inner peace and tap into the multidimensionality that we truly are? Mm -hmm. And the answer is absolutely. And I feel like I've been on both sides of the pendulum swing one way to the other. And I'm really finding this balance within and um, it feels like true freedom to me. Mm -hmm. It looks like freedom. <laughs> it looks good on you. You could totally yeah. do both. And that's so, I love the wild woman and I love how that can be embodied softly. That is the feminine that I believe that is coming to light and everybody embodies it and you Absolutely. can. And I think that's powerful. Have you been, do you remind me if you have a motorcycle at this point or you were kind of in between bikes or? Yeah, I don't right now, but I have just been itching to get one. I actually, there's a Harley Davidson shop right across the highway from where I live right now. And I drive past it every day and 
it's uh it's coming soon I'll say yeah. that <laughs> motivation put that yeah put, put that on the manifestation dream board <laughs> absolutely it's already there <laughs> love it uh, share with us what you're growing through right now and also what keeps you growing every day. Kind of a two-part question. Yeah. Um, I mean, what keeps me growing every day is really embodying my spirituality, my spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. I really notice the difference of when I'm in devotion to my practice and when I kind of fall out of that a little bit, right? Life gets busy, like you mentioned, I travel a lot. So it's, it's hard to find that balance of being in devotion to uh, my spiritual practice. But the growth for me is really um, learning to find unconditional love and no longer abandoning self. And that is something that I've really been um, tapping into and growing through and growing with. It's the unconditional love that I have for self and finding all of these little pieces and these layers of um, where have I been abandoning self? Where am I still maybe people pleasing with other others? And this space of, you know, I have a really good friend um, that has this saying, and she says, when the people pleaser in you dies, the God in you will arise. And I love that so much because it really brings us into this place of empowerment. So that's something personally I've been really been working through and growing through is finding radical self-love um, no longer abandoning self and just tuning into where can I be in more of the presence of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. um, as I've been diving into unconditional love, I realized that so many humans actually love with condition. We think that we're loving unconditionally, but most of the time there's some sort of attachment and, um, you know, underlying maybe wound or something that's attached to what we think is this unconditional love that we're perceiving. And so I've really been diving into that frequency and that vibration and feeling like um, through my spirituality and my spiritual work, I'm really a steward of this frequency and this code, anchoring it in here on the earth plane. And, um, you know, it's, it's the truest essence of who we are is just love and specifically unconditional love. So that's something that I've really been growing through and, and tuning into, um, you know, the last six months specifically. It seems as though this people pleasing tendencies is, is really common. Mm. And I'd love to hear your reflection on for yourself, why this pattern exists. That's so deep that we're still carrying it and working through it. And it's, I mean, for me, I could speak for myself that it's constant. It's a constant reminder to come back to self, to love self fully, to unconditionally love self and others fully. So I would love to lean into this more. I think that could be really relatable on the people mm -hmm. side. Yeah. You know, it's so fascinating to me as I really start to understand how much we're just really all mirrors of each other mm -hmm. and you know, self-sabotaging is really the ultimate abandonment of not only self in your human walk, but of the abandonment of your soul. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've walked through this so deeply that it actually physically manifested pretty intensely in my body as I had really um, pretty severe asthma growing up as a kid. And I was a heavy equipment operator that worked in an oil sands mine for a decade. And I started to, to really develop some issues with my lungs, thinking that it was like this, this physical issue. And I um, had recently done plant medicine with a shaman last year. It was about six months ago. And he had expressed to me that, um, well, I thought that grief was the issue of, um, my, my lung issue and, and the lung disease that I was working through and healing. And, and I would love to say right now that I feel like I have fully healed it. Um, I haven't had any flare ups in a long time, but we all know that things ebb and flow in life, but the connection to the self abandonment with my lungs is that the deeper root of lung disease is, um, is the abandonment of your soul's truest desire. So it's the grief that is this hard shell around your heart space that, that, um, you know, you kind of have to peel back the layers to heal the heart and heal the lungs underneath the grief. The grief was actually there because I was abandoning self. I was abandoning soul. So 
I've walked through my life abandoning self thinking that if I chose myself, I would be abandoned by others. Mm -hmm. So it's this tendency of I'm going to continue to abandon self to please other people, because if I really choose myself and I, you know, honor my soul's truest desires, will I be abandoned by others or will that be celebrated? And, you know, I'm assuming that is deep in ancestral lines and most likely past life trauma. Um, you know, it, it, it dives so deep to really get to the root of it. It's, it's hard to really know exactly what the root of that is. But when we can have awareness around at least the understanding of the foundation of that wound, we can then go in and feel it and heal it and release it, alchemize it and transmute into a higher place of consciousness. Mm. does it feel scary to go within and just completely love self above others do you find a little bit of fear there like you're saying that other people might leave you as well if you aren't focused on them fully and maybe within that what are a few a few examples of of what you're doing when you're abandoning self what does that look like Mm. yeah I would say you know consciously i i feel like when i've noticed myself you know playing out these these different patterns mm-hmm. consciously i don't feel like i there's fear there but unconsciously i know that there is right there's this this undeniable fear within self of of being abandoned um and i think something you know just like a, an example would be, you know, even with my morning routine, I've noticed that sometimes with my morning routine, if there's, you know, other people in my field, I've self-abandoned my morning routine, which I know is the most vital thing for me. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be a non-negotiable, but I have kind of thrown that out the window before because other people are, you know, wanting to do this or do that kind of thing, instead of taking the time for myself. Um, a lot, just, you know, small different things like that. But those are, I find it's like the micro to the macro, right? It's like, where am I just like, just like these tiny little ways that I'm self-abandoning that I'm like, oh, it's not that big of a deal, right? I'll just do my meditation later. And it's usually these small, very tiny threads where we don't think it's a big deal that actually add up so much over time. And what I've realized with self is that the more that we self-abandon soul or a self-abandoned self, um, the less empowered we are. And I've had this really powerful visual a little while ago of, you know, our soul is so vast. It, it goes across all time and space. And the more that we honor the soul, the more that we lean into the de- desires of the soul, the more the soul wants to land in the body, right? Because the soul isn't just in this vessel, right? It's, we're so multidimensional. We are, you know, we are, we're all over many different dimensions in space and time. But the more that we honor soul, the more soul wants to drop into this vessel because it feels like it is being honored here. And the more that we release these stories and these programs and conditions, we actually create more space for the the soul's truest essence to drop in. Mm. And that is what I've really found in my journey is the more that I clear these patterns, these conditions, these beliefs, and I truly honor self, even just small adjustments in the morning, like choosing my meditation over anything else, any other noise going on. I feel so much more empowered throughout the day and I can feel the presence within me where I'm not, you know, kind of out of my body all day. The soul wants to be in the body because it's being honored. It's almost like a, a devotion to yourself, to your own soul. What's coming alive is this creation of home within. Mm. You find yeah. a deeper connection where the soul feels at home. And when your soul's home, you're, you're lit. Mm. And I know that feeling and I can completely relate with that. And what's beautiful about that is then you're attracting people 
that are of that same vibration, which just feels better in general, because I too, like you, if I skip that morning routine or push some certain things aside that are the micro, it changes the macro. And then I find myself seeking and trying to take care of everyone around me. And I'm outside of the body. So that really resonates that when we create this deeper connection with self, it's like that flow state. Is that how you would, is that how that feels for you? Absolutely. Yes. Without a doubt. And how do we, cause I just experienced this when I'm home with my family, there's so much going on. I'm out of my routine. I'm out of my, you know, I didn't normally sleep how I would or wake up how I would. And how do you balance that? How do you find that? Cause I always go in with the best intentions <laughs> and then a few days in, I'm like, holy crap, I haven't done these things that I know brings my soul back home. Yeah. I think it's, you know, before going into those spaces, if you know that they're going to be hectic, really have it, having a conversation with self and saying, what are my non-negotiables and what boundaries am I putting in place? And especially with family, it's hard, right? And especially if you're just newly putting boundaries in place, they're going to be like, what is this, right? You've never, you know, put this boundary here before. And it's always those that aren't used to you putting in boundaries that have the most pushback, Right. Um, but it is just getting really clear on what is your non-negotiable. What is the one thing, you know, whether it's in the morning or maybe some space in the afternoon, whatever that looks like for you, everybody's different. Um, but just taking some time for yourself to be meeting your own personal needs. And so I think the first thing is getting clear on that and creating a non-negotiable with yourself and, You know, it's easy to get back into these old routines when we're back in these spaces where maybe we didn't have non-negotiables before, right? So it's, we kind of slip back into those old patterns, especially with family. So I think the more awareness we can have going in, the better chance that we have of actually sticking to something. Um, And again, it's, it's the micro, right? The micro adjustment. So it doesn't have to be some big thing. It's just like, what is important for you to take time for yourself each day? And just making sure that that happens. Mm. Are there other pieces that are non-negotiable besides your meditation? Um, I mean, right now I feel like that's the biggest thing for me is really my practice. Um, I have about an hour practice every single morning and it's just, it is my non-negotiable right now for myself. It definitely has ebbed and flowed and and shifted and changed. And I think that's important for people to know as well, um, that it doesn't have to be this, this one thing. You know, there's so many modalities out there and, um, you know, maybe something's working for a month and then it feels like it's not really giving you the benefits and you find something else and that comes in and you feel like maybe that is working better with you. So it's mm-hmm. it's allowing, you know, just as life, Right. We have these different flow states that want to come into our life. So it's honoring what wants to be here now. So right now for me, it is meditation and, um, you know, an hour in the morning isn't something that I've always done, but I am preparing for uh, a women's retreat where I'm holding a lot of space. So that has been my non-negotiable um, for the last 30 days for myself. So, and I've been sticking to that and I'm, I'm really proud of myself for doing that because it's not always easy in, especially in the mornings. <laughs> yeah. Do you, yeah, I, first of all, love this idea of being flexible with it because I know when I first started meditating, I loved the way I felt. And then on days that I would forget or wake up a little too late, I would shame myself or then like get in that headspace where it almost would make my day worse. <laughs> even though I know meditation makes it better, it doesn't have to be a worse day without it. So I really love that idea of flexibility and saying, well, you know, at least I got up and drank my water and got a little bit of sky time before my screen or something like that to where we keep going back to those micro pieces Mm -hmm. that we do know contribute. So it's almost like just awareness of the healthier habits that help us feel good and allowing it to an ebb and flow. Yeah. Well, I love that so much that you brought up the shame piece, because that's something that I've really noticed that that was something that I used to do. Mm -hmm. And um, a really good friend of mine, she channels and she had this really powerful channel one day and it was just her and I, uh, you know, sitting together and it really connected into the shame piece, right. Of 
we wake up, we shame ourselves for not doing the thing. And then we feel bad about it all day. And it keeps us in this low frequency. Whereas if we woke up and just noticed, oh, hey, you know, maybe I slept in a little and now I don't have time for the meditation. I'm just going to let that go. And I'm going to make time for it later. And it's not that big of a deal. And I'm going to be in love and I'm going to be in gratitude and open the blinds. And what a beautiful morning to be alive, right? And something that my friend channeled was I was speaking to her. This was a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I had kind of this moment where I thought I put myself on this lower timeline. And um, anyway, she was giggling at me. But what she had expressed was, yes, there's timelines and there's infinite possibilities. And, you know, as humans, we kind of get really like maybe in these these patterns or this conditioning of a little bit of doom and gloom, right? Like, oh, I didn't do the thing today. And then we have all the shame on it. Where when we start looking into multidimensionality in the quantum field, that we can shift everything in one moment. It's all frequency and vibration. So if we have the awareness that we're bringing in a shame piece, we just are aware of that. And we bring compassion to that piece. We let it go and we come back into our hearts and unconditional love. And that is the micro to the macro adjustment that is going to create the biggest shift in your life, probably even bigger than doing meditation every day, right? It's like what frequency and vibration are we in and not holding yourself in these um, lower constructs, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And those moments happen can happen over and over and over all day. So even if we sit in meditation for as long as we possibly can, I believe and experience that those moments can still pop up. So I love that you're bringing that to light because it is in those moments where we just hold that little self of ours that was probably shamed at one point back in our early childhood or throughout any time in our life. And that's where that pain point is coming up. And so to re reprogram in a way that it's okay. Mm -hmm that it's okay, that that doesn't make us a bad person, that we're not going to have, you know, a lower vibrational whole life, or, you know, we can start going into that doom and gloom that it's just a moment. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and you have said the word awareness multiple times, which is so important. Do you feel like that's been the key to your shifts is most first and foremost, just awareness of self and thoughts mm -hmm. and patterns? Absolutely. To me, um, to me, awareness is such a big piece of it. You know, when we even look at the definition of consciousness, it's higher awareness. So it's, you know, you were kind of explaining um, how those pieces are always there. You know, I still have these patterns and, and subconscious loops and these things that reoccur in my life, right? It's what I found is as I've gone throughout my spiritual journey, that things have been easier, but they don't just completely, you know, go away. We still have these patterns. We still have these things coming up from childhood. Um, you know, I have things reoccurring from past life stuff that's coming up. So the healing journey is just, you know, it's, it's a life journey. And so it's kind of how we look at it, but the awareness piece is the more awareness that I can have and kind of bring myself into this higher, almost like an observer effect of, oh, wow, I'm noticing my mind is in a pattern right now. Okay, I'm not going to shame myself for my mind being in that pattern. I'm going to be aware of it and realize that I can consciously shift the, the pattern that my mind is currently currently in. I have a stellium in Gemini. So I'm like, there's a lot in my mind. There's a lot of... Um, like mind pieces for me. I feel like I'm almost here to, to master the mind kind of thing. So what I realized with awareness is we can go in and we can shift in real time. And that's how through these micro adjustments, we can really start rewriting the neural pathways in our brain chemistry to then shift the, the perspective, right? Because everything is really perspective. Are we going to be focusing on, you know, something negative or something positive? And that's not to bypass emotions. It's it's vitally Im important to feel the full human spectrum of emotions. But where are we focusing our, our attention on? And I feel like the human consciousness as a whole likes to really focus on the negative aspects. So if we can have awareness of where we are focusing our attention or our, our, our mind, 
and shift that in real time, that's how we really start to um, create a new vibrational field for not only us to reside in, but the collective as a whole. And instead of allowing yourself to go down that loophole of the negative, the recognition and the comeback, the awareness and the comeback over and over, that mm. feels like that's the practice. Yeah, absolutely. And not beating yourself up about continuing to go back into that negative thought pattern, right? Because it is, it's just that we have so much conditioning on us. We have so much program on us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of what we're here for, right? We're really here to heal through the trauma and the programs and everything that's been placed on us. And it's, you know, how long has the human conditioning been in the way that it is? So it's, it's not, um, you know, a one and done kind of job. It's not something we can just do overnight. And it really makes me, um, you know, realize as we incarnate here on this planet of, you know, the, the strong warriors that we really are coming down into a paradigm of, um, a lot of struggle and we're in a, we're in such a beautiful time right now to be here in the human existence and the human journey of, um, you know, mass evolution on just such a beautiful scale. So it's, you know, even in the dismantling of everything, it's like, how can we see the perspective of, you know, structures are crumbling, but it's to build new, more aligned ones in place. So it's, it's so much about awareness and where we're really focusing our attention. It is a beautiful time and a really difficult time, but I, I like that you use the word warrior because that is how it feels on a lot of days and, and finding that balance, the feminine and the masculine balance. And, um, you know, I think that technology is a beautiful thing, but that definitely feels like a huge piece of what we get to grow through because it gives you so much information so quickly and talk about lighting up the mind all the time. Mm -hmm. So I can completely relate with you on this mind, busy mind. And I think a lot of people would say that about themselves, that my mind is so busy. I don't know if you hear this from the women you work with and the men you work with. It's like, I can't meditate. I can't shut my mind off. And I'm curious how you've worked through that personally and how you help guide others through what feels like a really big challenge. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I think technology is a big piece of that just because we're so overstimulated, right? So our mind is just feels really overwhelmed. There's it's there's a lot of chaos right going on within within the mind space. And you know, I think the piece with meditation is if quieting the mind and getting still um <clears throat> within that piece is difficult, a guided meditation might be better or something that I've found extremely beneficial to quiet the mind is breath work because it allows the mind just to completely it, it's almost like you bring it into that like theta brainwave state right it allows the mind to kind of slow down it almost puts it in that deep meditative state um you know like kind of like right before you go to sleep at night it's it's that in between state and it can get you into that flow state where the mind quiets down and of course, flooding the oxygen with body as well, um, or the body with oxygen as well can be super, super powerful. So breath work is something that I absolutely love. And I found that to be um, just a massive piece for me within that. And I also work with plant medicine. So um, I've worked with um, just microdosing psilocybin, which I found to be extremely benef beneficial as well for me to really set strong intention and rewire the neural pathways within my, my brain chemistry to anchor in the pieces of what I'm really wanting to shift. Love that. Yeah. Do you drop right in when you, so I presume you're micro dosing, so it's not, you're not tripping, right? Mm -hmm. So for those yeah. of us, I mean, I know psilocybin and microdosing is really becoming um, a powerful way to help people through PTSDs and they're using it for a lot of mental health connections and, um, you know, we don't have to go too far down that, but does, do you find that it quiets your mind and you're more aware? Like, do you become 
the thinker of your thoughts, <laughs> you know, or the awareness, what's that feel like? Yeah. So I take a very, very small amount. Um, so with a microdose, you shouldn't actually feel it whatsoever. It's really just working in the background. It's so incredibly subtle that it's, you wouldn't feel different towards your day to day. Um, and I don't recommend anyone just go out and try it, of course, right? Like find a guide and, and a facilitator if it's something that you're interested in. Um, safety is so important within, you know, the medicine space. Um, for me, it really helps with the creative flow. It, um, you know, I've been working with it for some time and over time for me, it has really helped me reduce the anxiety and the chatter of the mind. And it's really assisted me in, in, you know, with my other practices, meditation and breath work, which has really allowed me to, um, like calibrate my nervous system in a way that, I've been able to get into that flow state, right? Into that creative mind, instead of it just being so busy and so noisy that I can focus on task at hand and just open my creative channel and be within that creative channel. Um, and, you know, over time, psilocybin, you're, you're meant to not actually work with it anymore, where it's actually just done that reprogramming in the background, where then you actually don't need the medicine at all. And that's, you know, the beautiful thing about plant medicine is it's not something you're supposed to rely on it kind of has this background working going and then you just have the ability to be in that state and that's the integration period which is the, the most important part really important and really powerful because it's not you said something that really highlighted that you're using this along with your other practices this is not a quick fix just like a lot of pharmaceuticals i dislike that part about pharmaceuticals is it's like here's this one pill you probably need other ones to combat this one and you're going to be on it forever so i think that that's where plant medicine will be really powerful in our future that it's telling us work this into your rituals into your healthy habits and know that once this new neural pathway is formed, once you are finding your soul space, once you are more confident in yourself and the thoughts have you know subsided in certain ways, you're not in this worrying pattern, whether that's future worry or past pains. Once you've come to that more peaceful state, you can move forward. It's mm -hmm. not a forever journey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I only really microdose a couple of times a year and I'll do like a two month kind of container. And then that's it. And you really shouldn't need more than that. Um, because again, it's, it's super powerful and yet subtle mm -hmm. and something that just really, um, yeah, works, works in the background, which is a really beautiful part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And with our rituals, right. We kind of absolutely mm -hmm. concoction of things that work for us. Like yeah. Journaling, I think is super powerful to work through a lot of that. I can imagine that microdosing and journaling would be really cool just to allow yourself to freehand write the things that are running rampant in your mind. Um, mm. Is that a part of your practice is to journal? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think just within all of it, right, it's, it's creating ceremony out of, you know, every little thing that you do. It's, you know, what is the intention behind it? And an intention is the most important piece, whether you're, you know, working with psychedelics or you're just going for a walk or you're doing the dishes, right? We can really bring in an int intentionality in, in every aspect of it. Um, and, you know, journaling is, is absolutely a big part of my practice. Um, I also really love to just leave myself voice notes because I find that when I'm really in my channel, sometimes the information comes through quite quickly for me. And I find that sometimes like pen to paper isn't kind of fast enough for what really is wanting to come through. And so I've really found that voice voice notes are really powerful. And it's also something that I can then go back and delete immediately if I if I just feel like it's this is something that I really just need to get out. And, you know, sometimes I find I've worked with clients with journaling and the fear for them is, is someone going to find the journal? Or are they going to read it or whatever that may be? So I always express, you know, you can always take the page out, you can rip it up, you can burn it, you can create ceremony even out of that. Um, so yeah, anytime that you can get your thoughts out, whether it be speaking or on paper, it's something that's really powerful as well. And what I've really been noticing with my own clients is that I find as we're going through this evolutionary period and, and we're starting to really raise our vibration to a new level, a lot of people's channels are opening. 
So a lot of the mind chatter and, and the overwhelm that they think is also just the mind, a lot of it can also be them opening up a spiritual gift and opening up a channel. And without the understanding of how to really, um, you know, em embody, open up, receive those codes, ground them into self, it can kind of just be this overwhelm of information that's getting stored in the auric field, which can create a lot of busy mind chatter as well. Um, so there's different practices that you can do for that. The journaling, the speaking out loud, right? Getting it out of your field and just allowing it to flow through you. Dance is something that I would highly recommend as well for those that love to be in the feminine flow of releasing energy. Um, because that's when we really get down to it, that's what it is, right? It's all energy just stored in the body. And awareness. And awareness, yeah hearing these thoughts I heard something once that said if you're actually aware of the thoughts and thinking about the thoughts you're in a meditative state because a lot of the times when you're overthinking you're not catching on to it it's just flowing through you but if you are being more the observer like you said that can be a meditative state and what if there was a way to just allow it to run and then yeah. go, oh my gosh, you know, I've thought about that a lot. What does that mean to me? Why does this keep coming up? Why does that event from my past keep popping up when I find stillness? What's there for me? And and I think that's a really cool thing as you're saying, channel. Mm -hmm. What is coming into my channel and why? And is there a message there for me? It Maybe it's not just this surface thing that I think it is. Can I lean into it a little bit deeper? And Absolutely. get curious. Like, can we get curious about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would love to talk about your journey to where you're at now. Mm -hmm. um, curious if from a young girl, you felt a deeper connection. If you were curious with these spiritual channels, if you heard voices, if you had experiences and, you know, just how you've ebb and flowed as much as you want to share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I feel like my spiritual connection was very strong from a very young age for me. Um, you know, I was just sharing with someone the other day, my first experience that I ever had really understanding or noticing that maybe I was tapping into something that not only other children weren't, but you know, most other adults uh, weren't as well at that time is that my first memories when I was five years old, I learned how to um, have an out-of-body experience. So astral project out of my physical body. And I used to open up portals in my headboard and I would travel through these portals and go into other dimensional worlds. And so I, I can remember doing that my entire life. And I actually just had a really powerful realization a little while ago, realizing that as a child, I learned how to do that out of a trauma response because my environment wasn't safe. So it actually didn't feel safe to be in my body. So my soul, uh, you know, basically learned how to exit my physical form, which all of our souls know how to do right at sleep. When we go to sleep at night, we had out of, out of body experiences and we all astral project, but I was consciously being aware of what I was doing. So learning as I was getting older, is that was actually a really powerful gift that I had. And um, realizing that I, as I got older, that it was important for me to cultivate that and rewrite that program within me of, um, it no longer being a trauma response and getting to cultivate that actually as a spiritual gift, because what I realized is that now in, in where I'm at right now in my journey is I can consciously astral project out of my body, tap into higher dimensional fields um, embody my higher self, connect with my galactic family of light and a bunch of other guides that are soul contracted to me. But I also noticed that I was still leaving my body out of a trauma response. And I just ha had awareness brought into my field a little while ago around this. As I realized, um, you know, one day I was kind of in this like headspace of not fully being in my body. And what I realized is I was still in this experience that had happened the day before where I 
you know, had an, had a, a triggering moment where it actually brought me out of my physical form. And I realized I kept being brought back to that experience. So that was the trauma response actually pulling me back into that environment where a fragment of me was actually stuck in there. And it was all coded for me to see that and realize it so I could heal that piece um, and just create that as being the spiritual gift. So yeah, since I was little, I have been astral projecting and, and connecting. I started connecting with angels when I was really little. That was, you know, the, the first higher dimensional being or um, the higher, uh, a higher dimensional realm that I was really tapping into was the angelic realm. And then it started being my galactic family of light. And it's kind of just expanded ever since then. Um, and that's why my meditation practice is just a non-negotiable for me because with the mind piece, um, I have so much information that's just coming in all the time that if I'm not physically grounding in the morning and opening my channel and allowing it to free flow through, it it tends to create some chaos into my field, which will actually manifest in, into my physical field as well. Very powerful uh, experience. Yeah. At that age, and then to be able to bring it full circle into your life now and utilize this as your practice. Do you go into it with questions or they have offerings for you? What's the, I mean, of course, not only to ground and center and align your energy in this meditative practice to help your whole day feel more in flow. What's the messaging there for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, every day it's so different. I feel like, um, you know, some days I just go into ground and open my channel and just ask, you know, what is in my highest and best for me to know today? Are there any specific messages for me? So sometimes it is them giving me messages. And then sometimes I have very specific questions of, hey, I've noticed this pattern is coming up or, you know, maybe I'm going through a difficult time or I have a big choice or decision or something coming up in my near future that I just, I don't have a lot of clarity on, I can go up into those spaces and connect and, and gain more direct access and clarity. Um, and that is really where the cultivation of the unconditional love has really started to um, connect in and, and have this really um, kind of deep relationship with that frequency and that vibration is, uh, you know, was going through something pretty heavy last year. And I kept going up and connecting and asking, you know, just looking for clarity. Why is this unfolding? And and where do I, you know, where do I go from here? Just feeling really lost. And um, I had this really powerful experience where my higher self kind of, you know, kept tapping me on the head and then tapping me on the heart. And the message was the more that I could get out of my mind and just drop into my heart and take some deep breaths there and, and shift the, the frequency of the overwhelm in the mind. And, you know, kind of like we did it in the beginning of this podcast, right? Just taking that moment and getting out of the mind and dropping into the heart and deepening the breath. It's so much shift in frequency. We can open up so much possibility just in those few moments. Um, so that was a big lesson in teaching for me. And I will say that a lot of the time it's so simple, the messages or what wants to come through, right? The human mind wants to complicate so much of it and see the, and look for these big ahas and, and these, you know, these magical things. And of course there's so much magic within what I've experienced, but um, so much of it is just the simplicity of life and coming back to, to love and presence and um, the deep honoring and devotion to self, because when we honor and we're devoted to self, it's also honoring and being devotion of the collective and, and the divine plan. So it's, it all weaves together just so beautifully. And healing. Yeah, very healing. Mm -hmm. oh, and that self love piece and what's coming to light when you are speaking about this is trusting mm -hmm. those guides, trusting the voices, trusting, because I think that you know, even a few years ago, I would have been like, what, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, this head talk and, and these guides and what, how do you decipher between each? And are you making it up? Cause sometimes I think like, okay. Um, I think that 
there's these moments of, is this voice for my highest good? And how do I decipher between <laughs> ego and love and guidance and intuition and my actual guides? And so I think that, that is a powerful piece that you have made clear that everyone has guides. And if you're practicing these rituals and coming back to this self-love by not abandoning self, we come into this trusting, loving relationship. And something that I've heard recently is, is your intuition and your guides, um, they will be helpful and calm and loving and supportive. And if that's not the message that you're getting, you're probably tapped into more of an ego space. Do you Mm -hmm. feel that that's true for you? Have you felt both and how do you how do you decipher what messages to really listen to yeah that's that's a really good point to bring up and I think that is a lot of question uh, that's you know a big question for a lot of people um you know something that when I discovered how to open up my Akashic records and start tuning into that space something that came through um very strongly is learning how to work with the ego and bring the ego in where we're not so much battling the ego anymore. So when I go into a channeling session, I bring in my ego into that space every single time. And I ask my ego just to take a seat as a curious student. Mm -hmm. So within doing that, there seems to be not so much battle with the ego because the ego is feeling like it's along for the ride. And, you know, I hear so much of like death of the ego. And of course, right, we have these death and rebirth cycles, and that's a very real thing. But what I realize is that even with like personas, right, we have identities and personas and different masks that we tend to create throughout throughout our lifetime. When we look at things within us as being bad or wrong, they tend to have a lot of pushback or pullback or more resistance of kind of perpetuating that that bad or wrong kind of thing if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so I never tell my ego that you know I'm I'm having an ego death or I'm killing you off or anything like that I always work with my ego and so in doing so I in doing so with that practice I've really found that I can feel a vibrational shift where things are coming truly from higher self um, coming from my guides and then coming from ego. But when we're bringing an ego into the practice as just a loving, curious student, they don't tend to actually chime in, in those spaces. They actually allow for your higher truth, higher self, whatever wants to come through. And it allows a much more easeful process of that information coming through, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's almost like the ego becomes a foundation for your growth and for your ascension. It's like a supportive piece yeah. of you repressing it or pushing it away or death of ego over and over and over. That feels like it's just so low vibrational that if you stay there, how are you going to have enough energy to move towards the light? So I really love inviting it in and, yeah. and allowing it to be a part of the process yeah allowing it to be the loudest person in the room or the loudest part in the room yeah and and in doing so in building a relationship you can really tune in um a lot easier to know okay is this ego is this coming from higher self or higher guidance and when I know that I'm about to have this you know death and rebirth and expansive um experience in my life I invite the ego in and say, okay, we're, we're about to evolve together, right? So let's, let's evolve and transcend into higher together. So I actually bring the ego along and I find that there's, there's not a lot of resistance, right? They want to, they, because I find that in those pieces, it's almost like I'm just abandoning more of myself, right? It's, there's pieces that don't want to be abandoned that don't want to be left behind. So I invite all shadow light ego personas when I feel like I'm going through this massive transition it's all welcome and I bring it all in and give it the option and the choice to expand and evolve and you know and transcend with me Hmm. I'm picturing a flower and just that you wouldn't take parts of the flower and 
leave parts out and it all goes together and it all cycles back into the earth and re-germinates and then comes back to life in a new form. And yeah, why would we pick and choose parts of ourself? And I think that you've probably seen what I've seen of this death of ego and get rid of it and quiet it down and repress it when I just, I'm like lit up by this idea. And, and, and I think I do it a little bit naturally because I don't want to battle myself. And I'm working on similar things with you of full self-acceptance, non-abandonment, full self-love of all the parts, the shadow, the light, and just to make a conversation with it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome here. (laughs) be supportive. We'll love you back. You know, like let's all work, all work together. Cause we need the light in the dark. We, that's okay. just all the full circumference of, of life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, maybe the death and rebirth of the ego, you know, works for some. So of course, like take what resonates and leave the rest. But for me, I've done both. And I've just found that when, I just, I welcome all parts and pieces in when I know that, you know, I'm, I'm ready to evolve or I'm leveling up and in this next space, there's zero resistance within it. So it's just what I found to, to really work for me, because like you're saying, right, we are, we're the polarity of all of it. We're the light and the dark and the masculine and the feminine. And we're, we invite all parts in and meet it all with compassion and, and unconditional love. It's even the shame pieces, right. That we talked about earlier, Right bring them in so they don't feel like they're excluded or when we're feeling these shame things come up inviting them in and meeting them with unconditional love because it's all it's all part of us so when we can learn to soften and meet all parts with with compassion unconditional love the the shift in perspective and wholeness you can just you can really feel the difference in your physical and energetic bodies when you start to have that shift in perspective Absolutely. Yeah. Have there been parts in your life where you compartmentalized this part, knowing that it was super powerful within you? Maybe you were afraid of its power and you leaned more towards darker things, low vibrational parts, where of course there were lessons there. And how have you been able to get back? if that makes sense. Like, did you lean into, I know we've talked about addiction or, you know, Mm -hmm. partnerships that weren't fully aligned. And do you look back now and see that that happened for, because you were running from parts of the light and this big, big, beautiful, powerful part of you, or where do you see that as how it's fit into your, into your life? And you've grown so much from that. I'm just curious if you're open to sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm just kind of like having a bit of a process, even with you explaining that. So, um, you know, I feel like my spirituality opened up at such a young age, right. And as I started to grow and get into my twenties, it just continued to, to open and expand. And I feel like, um, you know, at that time it would have been, I believe like 2009, 2010, And I was very vocal about my spirituality and my belief systems and, you know, connecting to higher dimensional beings. And that started to be very um, judged by others outside of self. And I was feeling like, you know, I I guess it would have been that piece, right, of self-abandoning because everyone else around me wasn't really ready for that level of understanding of, of spirituality. So I started to really shut myself down at that time in my life because, I felt like people were not receiving what I had to say that they weren't understanding or it wasn't landing. Um, And so I did, I got into a partnership that was very toxic and, you know, there was a lot of drinking and there was drug abuse and, you know, looking back on those pieces now, I feel like it was absolutely part of my journey and simultaneously it was me running from my light. Right. I think that through our choices here, we have an infinite amount of possibilities and timelines. I believe that we do have destiny points, but we have an infinite amount of ways that we can get there, even just depending on, you know, the small things that we do throughout our day. Are we getting out of bed on the left side or the right side, right? That can actually shift an entire timeline for us in just these small, subtle little ways. Um, I also know that addiction is such a 
um, just a deeply rooted wound in my bloodline. And I know that a part of what I came here for is to clear and transmute that in my bloodline. And I see the work that I'm doing on myself right now and how it's rippled into my family. And, and, you know, I have nephews and nieces and I really want to heal as much as I can. So they don't have to walk through the darkness and the shadows, maybe that, you know, my siblings and I have. So I think both really, when I look back on it, you know, I think I could have made the choice to choose myself at that young of age, but it felt really scary. I felt like I didn't have the support. Um, spirituality wasn't a mainstream thing back then. So it's almost like as I was getting gaslighted from outside, almost gaslighting self, right? Of Are they, maybe they're onto something, right? Like maybe this is all, all in my head or I'm making this up or because there wasn't the information out there like there is now, there's not the support at that time. Um, so yeah, I went into the depths of my shadows and, and met those pieces. And, um, you know, I feel like as we can meet those pieces for self, it really is, you know, I spoke of like the warrior earlier, right? It's coming down into this human walk, the density here, the, the shadow layers and the shadow pieces. Um, those that have struggled with addiction and walked that path, I mean, they are warriors. It's not an easy walk to meet those pieces and to, you know, whether you're still struggling with addiction or you've gotten on the other side of it, it's it's a lifelong walk and it takes a very strong soul to say yes to a contract of coming into a space of where there's addiction in the family line. And that's something that you've come here to clear or, or walk yourself in whatever way that that is right. There's so much, there's, there's so many lessons within walking that path and, and meeting the depths of those shadows here. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that I chose it as well because within all of it, right. The pain, the struggle, it's, it's also such a beautiful part of, of the human and existence is is the pendulum swing of, of of all of it so yeah and knowing and feeling that darkness helps us know and feel the light yeah yeah it's you know universal law of polarity this is something that I was just speaking of the other day it's like feeling the pendulum swing of life right it is it's like how far can I go into the darkness and pull myself back up into the light and it's that's the the ultimate transmutation of of what we came here to really you know walk and, and transmute is and and that's why i said the word warrior right it's like to the shadows of addiction are some of the 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 deepest and darkest in my in my opinion here on this planet so you know it's i really see all of those that are in that and um it's not an easy walk there's, you know, there's a lot of pain and struggle in it. And I'm happy to to share my story here because it is right. It's now that I I'm on the other side of it and I see all the pieces and what I've walked through and what I'm still witnessing my siblings that are, you know, still walking through it and very deep in it. Um, you know, it, it gets to be, you know, as I share my story, it gets to be someone else's, you know, mark of wow, there is light on the other side of it and it does get easier. And, that is a piece for me that is so important to share of, you know, the more that I've done the work on myself and the more that I've met those shadow pieces and transmuted them up into the light, the easier that it's gotten for me. Um, and of course it's always there, right? Those, those, those pieces are always in the background. So it's surrounding yourself in environments where, you know, maybe you're not going to be triggered in those places. And what I found is the more that I've put myself in an, certain environments and surround myself with the right people that celebrate me in the light and not in the depths of those shadow pieces it's those are the places that I've been able to expand the most and um you know really have been able just to step into the person that I truly came here to be and um you know and I, I also get to celebrate my journey to get here is knowing that it wasn't an easy walk to get to to where I am and I'm sure that there's, you know, still struggle on the horizon at, at some point, but it doesn't have to be so hard anymore, right? It doesn't have to be completely dismantling. And that's the awareness piece. Mm 
that when that comes in and choice you're making choices that keep lifting you up yeah the saying you can't heal where you were hurt Mm -hmm. that resonates with what you just said about we must become aware make the choice remove ourselves from the patterns and the people and the places that have kept us low vibrational in order to find our light and see others light because you also said earlier about being a reflection of each other and if you're in a low vibrational place all the time with low vibrational people not making them wrong or bad that's the reflection that you're going to get that awareness and the habits and pulling ourselves out and making that choice which all also comes back to self-love and worthiness Mm -hmm. are we worthy of that do we really truly desire to make that change? Cause that will be hard too. Yeah. It's a hard shift. And I'm curious at what point did you recognize I am in a low vibrational place? This feels dark and heavy. This is not working. What was that like? And what was that step? What was that next first step? And how did you kind of get the ball rolling in a new way and that self-love deepening in a new way? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, it's, it's very interesting for me because I was, um, I was, like I said, I was working in a mine at the time. I was a heavy equipment operator and I had been in a relationship, a pretty abusive relationship for eight years, right. And lacking self-worth, just abandoning self. And, um, you know, I'm played my part and and role in, in it too, right. It, It definitely goes both ways. Um, you know, shadow meeting shadow in the relationship, right. And kind of reflecting off of that. Um, we had actually just gotten engaged and I think that is what kind of pushed me over into this place of, I don't want this to be the rest of my life. Right. It was kind of that, um, realization of if I marry this person, this is going to be the rest of my life. So this is the crossroads for me to really choose. But at the same time, I still was terrified of making that leap and feeling like I was still in this really dark place. And, you know, I wasn't worthy of more and, you know, all of these stories we tell ourselves. Um, And at that time, I'd actually had um, gifted myself a medicine journey And I hadn't done a medicine journey in years. I think it had been, gosh, if I could guess, it it probably had been at least like six or seven years since I had even touched a psychedelic at that point. Um, It was more the darker substances that that I was tuning into that time, Um, not the ones that, you know, were tuning me into the light and higher frequencies, of course, keeping myself low. Um, And in the journey, my higher self, came to me and it still to this day is one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. Um, She came to me and she said, remember who you are and where your true path lies. Mm -hmm. And I came out of that experience just bawling my eyes out because I knew exactly what she meant. I was in this place of, am I staying? Am I going? And in that moment, I knew instantly that what she was speaking into was I had had a higher path and a higher calling, which was my spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And that I was in this place of going to continue to self-abandon. And in that moment, I knew that I had to make an, an, a massive shift in my life. So I ended up leaving that partnership. And, um, you know, it was about a month after that, that I had a very strong message come through, giving me a specific date of when I was supposed to leave my job. Um, and I was terrified of the thought of walking away from my job because it was security, it was safety, right? We put our safety in everything outside of self and give it meaning, right? Who am I without bringing in so much money a year and who I am, who, who am I without the safety of this job? It can really dismantle us as, as people when we lose relationships or jobs or whatever, um, that we put our value or worth in or safety in. Um, and then I, I really just started a path of, of medicine work and, and stepping into my spirituality and making it a non-negotiable to just continue to show up for myself. And it was, you know, it was a lot of fumbling in the beginning and it, you know, it wasn't a perfect, just, okay, I'm hanging up the towel of 
you know, um, addiction and, you know, alcohol and the partying and all of the things, but I had a higher vision and I knew my truth and what I was working towards. And I had times when, you know, I fell down and I made mistakes and I went back into old patterns and it took me a couple of years to really pull myself out of that. But every time I would fumble and fall, I wouldn't shame myself and I would just pick myself back up again and bring in the awareness and shoot and create different choices. Um, you know, something that uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza speaks about it is if you really want to, you know, create a different life, you have to completely shift and change everything about it. Right. So it's I ended up quitting my job. I left the city I lived in. I left my country um, completely just left everything behind and trusted with all my heart that where I was being led is where I was meant to be. And I ended up in Austin, Texas, and this is where I've started rooting in and creating community. And, um, it has been a beautiful journey to get here. Um, it definitely has not been an easy walk or easy road. And, you know, I still fumble at, at times and because we're still human and walking this journey and it's the piece of, picking ourselves up always with love and compassion and just continuing to move forward in the way that we're being called. It's like the deepest listening and, you know, just having fearless faith in it all. Wow. That's yeah. Really inspiring. And it is a journey. It's not an overnight process. And thank you for sharing that part because that is the resilience that comes from it. And sounds like the message you received gave you a deep why and something to really keep leaning back into. And I'm curious if were your main guides still the guides you were hearing and your channels, did you start to incorporate outside guides and, and women or men that you were looking up to? And how did that next support system look for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my spiritual guides, um, you know, that, that I connect to through meditation, they've definitely evolved over time. I feel like the more that you, the more that you elevate and raise your vibration, the higher aspects of dimensional fields that you actually have the ability to tap in and tune into. So I've had many new guides come along my journey, which has been really exciting and fun. And I feel like you're kind of contracted to different guides at different times that have, you know, certain medicine or information or just a frequency for your, for you to, to kind of work with at that time. Um, my guides here, you know, I have um, a number of, of people in the community that I have here that I look up to um, that are just extremely inspirational for me. And I have one spiritual mentor that I've been working with um, for quite some time that actually is based out of Utah. Um, and she does very similar work, work as me. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to have people, you know, earth bound and, and here in the physical realm that we look up to that we go to for guidance and wisdom that have, you know, are maybe a little farther down the timeline and have walked some of the path that you're walking now, because they have some of the blueprint, right? And yes, we're all on our own individual journey, but sometimes, you know, someone's story or, or things that lessons that they've worked through give you the ability to maybe not have to make those mistakes and, and have a deeper understanding. So as I connect with my guides, um, you know, my higher self and all of the guides that work with me, it's also very important for me to have people here that I look up to and that I can get on an actual phone call with or a zoom that can help me work through some of the things that I'm working through. So it's important to, to have, you know, both and the connection of both. Yeah. Again, that reflection, mm -hmm. it's that in-person relatability, it also brings community into the picture. And do you feel like that only validates the guides you're already hearing when somebody that's on the, the human plane says something, you're like, oh yeah, my guides already said that. So this just validates that that is the right path. And it's, it, they work together in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, one of the most special things that I've been able to cultivate while I've been here in Austin um, is just this incredible community of women that we gather, you know, quite often. And um you know we all kind of 
we we all know that we've lived many lifetimes together maybe here or other in in other realms but yeah it's very interesting I feel like because we all are mirrors of each other it's um it never ceases to completely blow my mind the synchronicities that I see in my physical um waking reality to what I'm receiving on the back end of things from higher self and from my guides and that is one of the biggest things that keeps me going um, in this forward motion of knowing that I'm in alignment. It's, um, you know, it's a daily pro it's a daily thing for me just to have many, many synchronicities um, from my community reflected to me. And yeah, just, it never stops being so incredibly magical to me. I love that. Yeah. If someone is in this place where they know it's not working, they know they're out of alignment, they're not physically feeling well, they've maybe lost their spiritual connection. It's just that darker, lower vibrational place that you and I both know is not permanent. We talked about non-attachment before we got on the call. Like, How can somebody find this awareness and what would be like a step or two that's digestible and simple to start this process to feeling a higher energetic vibration to connecting with people that will mirror back to them, their strengths. What, what would you say to somebody that's in that space? Mm, yeah. Um, that's a, that's a great question. And I feel like, you know, something that I would just really tune into is realizing first and foremost, that we always have choice right? So it's when we understand the choices that we really have in our life, we can claim our sovereignty over our life and our being. And something really simple that I would say would just be choose one thing, make a promise to yourself each day. And it can be something so small. Maybe it's as soon as I get out of bed, I'm going to drink a glass of water, right? It doesn't have to be something that's just this, you know, if you're just starting in your spiritual path and, and your spirituality, right? If meditation scares you or you're not really sure, right? It's get out of bed and take three deep breaths and just ground in your heart space, right? It maybe takes five, 10 seconds. Something so small, it's the micro to the macro adjustments that create the biggest shift and change. And if we can create little things that we promise that we're going to do for ourselves each day and actually meet those promises, you would be so surprised at how much trust you start cultivating within self. Because when we start to trust ourselves, we start to listen a little more. And what we start to understand is that we're actually being so guided. And when we listen and we start to trust ourselves, we're more likely to take action on what information is starting to come through. So I would say cultivating one thing a day, you know, maybe making a practice for, you know, it doesn't have to be 30 days, start with seven days, start with a week um, and make it so small that it's something that you're actually going to do. And you'll notice that you're going to get excited about that. Wow. I just seven days in a row, I just got out of breath, got out of bed and took three deep breaths every morning. And I actually did that for myself. And how much that actually starts shifting your frequency and your mood and how you start your day, it's really everything. Um, something that I've also been, um, you know, really doing and working on and, and sharing with my clients over the last year specifically is something that I call scripting. And this has been something that's been so powerful for me to manifest and call in the community or, you um, you know, different opportunities or whatever it may be is before I go to bed at night, each month I write out a script. So I talk in present tense, right? So you can get really clear. Of what is it that you are, right? If you're not happy in your life right now, you know, you want to change. What is the life that is, you know, attainable and something that you believe that you can work towards that you, that you would like to have right now. And you write it out in present tense and then I just read that every single night before I go to bed, which assists in reprogramming the subconscious mind as you're in the sleep state. And 
I like the amount of times that again, I've just been blown away of something I write in my script. Something when I first moved to Austin was cultivating community. I moved here. I really didn't know anyone, right? I didn't know a lot of people. And I wrote in my script that I was calling in and magnetizing in community that were in alignment with me and my core values and my spiritual beliefs. And the amount of community I have here now is just like over, it's over pouring, right? It's just, I feel like my heart can explode. Um, so that's just like a small little practice that I would recommend. And I know that it sounds like, you know, maybe silly or small, but it's one of those things that I've seen just work incredibly well. So um, yeah, I would say that and just keeping promises to yourself. And just showing up for self is is so vitally important. Mm. Really simple, so powerful, and yeah. loving this idea of these micro every days to build trust. Because if you don't trust yourself, yeah. how do you trust the world around you? And if you're making promises to yourself that are maybe unattainable, mm -hmm. then you're completely backtracking all the time and breaking that trust. So I, I love that it's digestible. I love that it's simple and calling it a script feels really cool because we are the director of this movie of this life. So it's like, okay, what's the next scene for this week or for this month or for this day, whatever feels right. So really, just really powerful. And we have both discovered this power of community and reaching out, asking for help and that to me is such a pivotal mo mo moment in our growth, in our change to say like, I can't do this on my own, whether that's joining a women's group or a men's group, whether that's going to, you know, a, even a workout program and, and, and cultivating community of people that are doing similar things or a book club or a ski club or whatever it might be, but just starting to form this community around you of mirrors and you and I have both experienced coaching. We're both have helped people through coaching. So um, that to me is, is a massive piece as well. Do you want to speak on what the coaching community means and, and you're hosting retreats now? What does that all look and feel like for you? And, and also opening up to how people can, can work with you and, and come retreat with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the community piece is, it's everything, you know, you spoke about not having to do it alone. And that is one of the biggest reflections that, that I actually get in the retreat space is, wow, I don't feel alone in this walk anymore. And I realize I don't have to do it alone. And I feel like that is the new paradigm that we're really anchoring in here is yes, we're having an individual experience but we actually don't have to do it alone anymore and we get to be held and supported and that's actually not looked at as being weakness act asking for help that's actually such strength and there's so much strength in being vulnerable and opening up and receiving um the support right and i think that's something that's really shifting here um and, you know, the retreat space for me is just, it's so special. It's one of those things that I can't even really put into words in, in, unless you just really experienced it. Um, and it's just, it's so magical to me seeing women come together and healing together and releasing those stories of comparison and shame. And, um, you know, something that we realized is that you know, as women rise together, that's where the power is, right? It's, we've had this program placed on us where we've, you know, there's been this comparison, there's this jealousy, there's this, um, you know, kind of uh, a darker agenda within that. And when we let go of those constructs, and we can be vulnerable with other women, we realize, oh, wow, you know, all of these women around me, they all have similar stories, we've all walked through some of the same things and we're seeking the same things we're seeking community we're seeking love and connection and the support so coming together and everyone just letting down their walls and releasing the shackles and healing and transmuting those pieces and then getting to witness each other's embodying our power um, it is unlike anything that I've ever experienced and you know the women that walk in to the women that walk out are just like 
just the true embodiment of, of feminine power. And, um, you know, I, I literally, I get chills just even thinking about it. And, you know, we have our, our next retreat coming up next weekend. So it's so soon for me. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just the coaching aspect of it again, right. It's this piece of, you know, so many people are really walking through these journeys by themselves and they don't know how to get the right support. And maybe they've seeked it out before and it hasn't really been in alignment. And, you know, my biggest why in being a, a coach um, and a spiritual mentor is knowing the walk that I had, right. I kind of, you know, shared my story of shrinking and playing small and then going into the, the depths of my shadows and into those, um, into that experience is that, um, you know, I want to be there and support others so they don't have to go through, you know, the decade of meeting their shadow as I did. And, you know, of course, we're all here to, to alchemize and transmute those pieces. But if I can be a support system where, you know, maybe, you know, in those places where I really wish that I had the support um, and I get so fired up and just fills my heart seeing people come in being very unsure of themselves and, and not trusting themselves and, you know, starting to open up their channel and their spiritual gifts and on the other side of it, and just seeing them so confident in their channel and their abilities and knowing their capability. It's again, right. It's, it's witnessing people in their power and that's how we rise together. And that's how we really shift the planet. So um, it's, it's what I'm here for. And I'm just, I'm so incredibly grateful and I feel blessed every day to, to get to do this work. I love that so much. I love watching you do your work. <laughs> you have also grown and transformed in the last year. And I've seen that and witnessed that and just thank you for being vulnerable and open about your journey and being willing to not only share, but then be a supporting factor in others and their and their own healing journey. I just truly believe and feel that we heal. Healing the collective is one of the most powerful things that we can do, but it really does start within because we can't help and support unless we are full of this self-love that we're talking about, this self-trust, this full circle of what you've been talking about. And um, it's just really beautiful to witness. And I think there's a lot of focus on the feminine and this rise of the feminine. And I want to remind everybody that that resides in all of us, masculine mm -hmm. and feminine, and we get to heal the masculine and the toxicity that lies there as well. So bringing both together is a, an, important part, an important part of the journey. And mm -hmm. this sisterhood wound for women specifically runs really deep. And I know that through my coaching programs um, that I've been in personally and cultivating sisterhood, like one that we have, even though it feels like very physically distant, like in the heart, it's really close and it feels good. And you have been a part of my healing. And I just, I thank you. I thank you for the light that you're sharing with this world. It's, it's really powerful to be a part of. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really feel that. And and so many of the depths and all of the layers and, you know, thank you also for just bringing up the piece of, of the masculine counterpart and the, the rise of the divine masculine, you know, the, the women can't just rise on their own. There needs to be also, you know, men stepping up and putting in the work and, and doing the work to heal and become the, the grounded masculine presence for women to really fully rise in the nature of, you know, their power and what they came here to do. And, and it's not one or the other, right? We really do get to rise together. Um, so something kind of, you know, that I really had these uh, visions within my meditation practice is there being this kind of pendulum swing of the rise of the divine feminine as we, you know, as we shift the ages, we just came out of the age of Pisces, we're coming into the age of Aquarius. Um, you know, it is said that there's going to be kind of this pendulum swing, but then it's going to balance out because we can't, you know, it's, it's not in the highest good for us to be one way or the other, right? It's like, it really is coming into union and that's how we find wholeness within self, right? It's the balance of the divine masculine and the balance of the divine feminine. And it's the same reflected out into the collective. So it's really fi finding balance within and then finding that balance within the collective as well. So 
um, that's an, definitely an, an important piece to, to point out as well. Yeah. Well said. And I love the pendulum. Like we are swinging that way and it does need that. And it does deserve that. And I do really feel this light that's coming to life and everybody that's wanting this alchemy, that's wanting this balance, that's seeing each other for the power that they are and not in this like manhandling power, this just like soft, graceful, loving, open. And of course it's not all rainbows and unicorns, although like in my bubble, I would like it to be that way, but you can see the darkness and you can see, like you were saying, the burning of the systems that are no longer serving and it's it there will be pain there they were there will be struggle there there will be difficulty there and the more we stay grounded the more we have conversations like this the more we stay with our ritual and see each other and lift each other for the light beings that we are that's the healing Mm -hmm. and that's the beauty in this life this human (laughs) this tough tough (laughs) beautiful human existence so yeah, absolutely. And I'm here for it all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all of it. Is there anything else that you feel called to share or you feel you feel complete? <laughs> I'm complete. I'm yeah, I'm just I'm really grateful for this conversation. I feel like, you know, we covered a lot of a lot of pieces and places and um, you know, it's in, it's important to to share the truth of, of it all and I'm just grateful that you've given me this platform to to come and share my story and you know, hopefully connect with even just one person of assisting them in their journey. I mean, that's, like I said, it's, it's what I'm here for. It's good to focus on that one because I think it gets overwhelming, but one person, that's a shift. Yeah. That's everything. It's everything. Yeah. That ripple effect is everything. So it begins within. Absolutely. Thank you for doing the work. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank honor. you so much. Mm, love you. Thank you. I love you as well.